So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sumit Kumar. Uh, I work in the C++ team at Microsoft. And uh, I realize that this is a slightly unusual topic for this conference. Rather than talking about Boost or the libraries or the language itself, uh, it's all about tools. Specifically about Visual Studio and um, the upcoming release. Uh, and the new features that help C++ develop on the internet. Um, how many of you are VS users here? Everyone, almost. <laughs> Not sure. What is this VS you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> good question. Uh, uh, and which version do you use? Uh, 2010? Everyone, 2010? Anybody older than 2008 here? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so. Um, So the way I'm uh, going to uh, do this, there are not very many slides. Uh, there are lots of demos. So I'll just keep talking, showing demos. And um, I'd like to save 10 minutes in the end for questions uh, so that the demo isn't interrupted. But if, if there is a question that is burning a hole in your head, feel free to stop. Um, uh, with that, let's, let's keep going. Uh, here's the outline. Uh, the, the, most of the time, the developers uh, spends in the editor, so I'll talk about some of the features in the editor itself that makes you more productive, and then some features uh, that talk about the interaction uh, with the rest of the IDE. And then I'll talk briefly about uh, new code analysis. Uh, and then I'll talk about a couple of debugging features. And if time permits, I will talk about some of the team oriented features that help you collaborate with your fellow C developers. Uh, like, uh, Code review, uh, many testing and those kind of things. Um, so let's go. Uh, let's get going. Um, so what you see here on the screen is uh, the new uh, Visual Studio. Well, it's not exactly new. It's about two and a half months old now. It's a beta bit. Uh, the next public release is about to come uh, later this month, I think. Um, so things have changed quite a bit. Um, so one of the things that you see in the UI itself. Uh, which is different from 2010 or 2008, is, uh, I don't know if you guys can make up the color on the projector here, but um, the, the, the UI in the Chrome of the VS is sort of uh, is in the background, so that your attention is drawn and focus is drawn more on the, the most important thing that is your code itself. Um, so this, th there has been this theme in this release to simplify the UI. Uh, Visual Studio is a very complex and, and a, a complex product and has a lot of features, but not everyone needs to see all of that by default all the time. So what we have done is, uh, so the toolbar, uh, if you look at the toolbar, it is much simpler. Uh, uh, we did some research and we did, uh, gathered some screen data, and we left only the most important ones there, and the ones that were less commonly used, we... What's a squam? Uh, good. Uh, it's it's a it's a way we get uh, user data anonymously. What's a what? Squim. <laughs> Squim service quality metrics. Oh. So so uh, when people uh, it basically the user uh, what what feature gets used we get uh, we get data. Oh. Uh, we don't get any uh, well, PII information, cool. but we get uh, this particular feature gets used. Yeah. Um, so what I have here is a um, um, you got question about the UI. When you have you have the theming option, you deliver it with two themes. Why didn't you leave a color richer theme like 2010 had? Uh, the, because right. I mean, I, I I will get used to this. Yes. I don't think it's a big problem. On the other hand, I kind of when when I first opened it, I just thought, you know, I often use. Visual cues, color. Color is an important visual cue to find the button on the toolbar that I'm looking for. And now the color is gone. Uh, so good question. Like I said, it is two and a half months old. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you get the next public release, you'll see a lot more colors. Okay. So we have gotten that feedback and we have improved. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you want to give more feedback, more specific things, uh, George here is from the UX team. And then he's doing some uh, user studies. Uh, he has passed some cards. So that will be a good thing to talk about. Uh, I'm not, I'll, I'll avoid the topic. <laughs> um, all right, so what I have here is uh, a demo app 
uh, that I'll, that has a bug that will fix the bug, and then in the process I'll demo some of the features. I'll be sitting down every now and then. Um, so let's let's build this thing. So what this is is a photo view wrap. Uh, it shows me pictures uh, from a folder, and it has some cool uh, animations. So if I do uh, click here, it brings the next picture to the fo uh, foreground and such. And if I click somewhere else, it does some cool animation. So, but the bug is, it doesn't do anything when I press the uh, arrow keys. So let's say uh, you're a developer, you join a new team, and your boss gives, I wish I had a better resolution than this one. Uh, your boss gives this application and says, here, go fix this bug. There are a lot of ways you go and debug and research and how, where the bug is. Uh, one of the new ways uh, is, I, I'll show you one of the new ways that we have added in this release. Uh, ideally, uh, you should have, when you take over a new application and join a new team, you should have been given a nice architecture diagram, you know, maybe more than one architecture diagram, high level for the components and then within the components themselves. But in reality, that seldom happens. All that you've got is a you know, source code. <laughs> then you go figure out, you uh, try to understand, and then you create a mental uh, architecture diagram, and then then you try, then you understand, and then you go look, drill down at a specific thing, and, and then you fix it. And if you are diligent, you go create a, uh, an architecture diagram, for, uh, and you share it with your team, maybe. Uh, but soon, soon, uh, you know, very soon, it becomes out of date and it's useless again. So what if you never had to do that? What if you could uh, create the architecture diagram from your, from your current source? Well, you can do that now. So the way you do it, you go to the architecture menu here, and you uh, generate dependency graph for the solution. So what this does is it, it builds your solution, and it creates a, a DGML uh, file, and then it renders that file on a rich diagramming surface here. Uh, so what you see here is it's a very uh, simple toy app, <laughs> and it has just two one binary, which is an exe, and it has. So if you select this, it shows it has dependency on some external thing. Uh, you can expand this particular binary, and it shows these are some of the uh, namespaces in it. You can expand these namespaces, and you. Uh, so there, there's legend here, you can modify things, and it shows what, what it is, and you can add your own stuff, but let, let's just get this out of the way. Um, so, uh, and then this, this uh, diagramming surface allows you to uh, lay out it in, uh, in a different way, uh, if you want, whatever is convenient to you. Uh, and then here are some options of what kind of links do you want to show. Uh, you can. Uh, right now, the default does show uh, the cross group links only on the selected node. So if I select this node, it shows uh, the links that this particular node has to an outside uh, binary here. So um, what you can do th uh, with this is you can save this whole thing as a as a JPEG, or you can copy this and uh, share this with your team. You can facilitate discussions. You can uh, uh, and whichever level of granularity you want, you can get that. Um, so, uh, so le let's say we are looking for uh, what happens when we do the key uh, press, and I'm looking for something like that, and I can't find anything interesting here. So I go and let's see this no name namespace. I expand this, and I uh, get a billion things here. See what you see is these are types, right? Uh, I can expand the types and get the members of the within these types. You know, I, let's say I don't find anything interesting here. Uh, I expand this. And the, the graph is very uh, dynamic, um, and it changes, so it, um, Does this use any dependency information in the solution, or um, that is to say, does this depend upon using the Microsoft build tools, or does this all work with Makebio? Uh, this uses, this is built into the Microsoft's build chain. Mm, but it takes all the information from the X in the DLS, not really from. It, it builds and then it uses, uh, it builds with a certain. Well, so I mean, we have solutions and we have applications, but the question is um, given that we use make files instead uh -huh. of building using the Microsoft. Uh, that, that should be doable, right? With make files. We support but that's a good question. We should yeah. follow up. I'm not uh, very sure, but we support make files also. In our build chain, so we should. Yes, of course you do. That's the only way we can use <laughs> Visual Studio. <laughs> the idea. 
So all right, now let's see, even in a simple application like this one, I'm soon, very soon lost and I don't know where uh, the right thing is. Although uh, if I select everyone, I can, each of these nodes, I can find the information here. It says this is a method and uh, it, it belongs to this thing. But if I want to find something, I can, uh, I get a, uh, I can search for a specific things. Say, let's say I want to find key and then I, this is what I was looking for, let's say, um, for the demo's sake. I mean, it's not as simple, but let's say you zero in on it and you want you want to do, uh, look for the method that does something with the keys. So I, I'm very easily able to get to that. So now let's uh, let's say I come here and I want to uh, in my in the process of my research, I can I want to mark this as a separate thing. I can categorize that, and uh, I can come back to it later if I want. Uh, in any case, so. Um, Let's say uh, this is the one that I want to uh, drill further into. So I want to now go and see what the source for this method looks like. If I hit F12 here, it takes me right to the source. So uh, uh, and one one more thing. So this uh, this is the uh, assembly or the binary uh, solution level uh, graph. But one thing that is of interest to C++ developers is we oftentimes, uh, you know, end, end up needing to create an include graph for uh, for our solutions. This particular CPP includes these headers, and those headers include some other headers. So now this enables you to uh, generate an include graph also very easily. Uh, so here, what I what you see is all the CPP files. <laughs> so. So let's say uh, this is the header file, uh, this is the CPP file. Uh, the solid lines here show all the header files that that CPP file includes, and then let's say this header file includes uh, some of the header files, so you can uh, very quickly, easily uh, build the include graph from this uh, new display. All right. Um, when you jump to uh, definition, uh, you knew to hit F12. What if you didn't know that? Is there a GUI? Uh, way uh, yes, to get yes, yes, yes. Uh, so let's just put this thing here. So let's go to this. So let's say here, I can say uh, go to. Ah, there, there. All right. So, yeah. Right. So, so um, <clears throat> if I have a whole bunch of projects in my solution, each one representing a different DLL, I can dive into a different DLL. Correct? Absolutely. All the binaries, Great. everything. So you, you can oh, get into. I'm sorry. Say that again. Into the binary. Yeah, the DLL. So that's what I'm doing right here. Uh, oh. This is a binary. I'm getting into that binary. So if you have DLL, you can drill into that. Yeah. How does this interact with static libraries? Um, does it show them as a separate block, or does it show them as embedded in an actual compiled block? Like XLDLL. Embedded. Yeah. embedded? What versions is this going to be available in? Uh, pretty, the upcoming 2011 version. The, the, but all, edition. all, all editions rather of that. Uh, uh, is it only I see. Not in Express, but it, it'll. Uh, I don't okay. think even in Pro, it's ultimate only. This is ultimate only. This is ultimate only. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there is also something based on 2010 that is not as complete. And uh, you have to install BS 2010 Ultimate, and there is a free add on since you already pay a lot of money for Ultimate. And but that also is for ultimately. Yes, and that's for ultimate body, and it gives uh, like a subset of these features. Yeah. So I see this percent oh. number up here. Is it the implication? Is it does it uh, allow me to do uh, uh, timing analysis? Uh, this percent quantitative. No, that's no, no that's just a view yeah. it expands, right? Oh, yeah. I see. All right, moving along. Um, if you have more questions, let's let's uh, take them. In the end. Uh, there is a performance analyzer, but it's a bit Yeah. Uh, there is a performance analyzer, but oh, it's a different right. module. So I do not know if you can. Uh, uh, so uh, editors got me. What's that? Editors got me. No, but colors. It, it's pretty. 
Yeah, the, 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 the projector's been a problem for everybody. Oh, it's it's an orientation. <laughs> so one of the things that you probably, if you could tell the colors here, is uh, we have a lot more colors than in the previous release. Uh, in addition to the blue keywords, and green comments, and red strings, and black, everything else, you now have uh, these types, which are in uh, teal color. And then there are uh, these uh, enum values, which are in a different shade of uh, green, and, and so on. So, so it, and the macros are purple, right? Uh, so what this is, is not only does it, uh, you know, it's not just eye candy. What it does is it makes the, the semantic structure of your code pop up and makes it easier for you to understand. And what we have uh, colorized only a few tokens by default, but we expose 20 plus uh, semantic tokens for you to go, uh, you know, uh, customize uh, if you if you are uh, you know coding style. Yeah. Do we have the ability to colorize all tokens in a namespace? Say I want to make boost, magenta, or stood, you know, plan. Can we do that? No. no? There are okay. specific tokens that we expose. And now, let me show which, which ones are those. Now, anyone knows how to get to, I can do that by font, tools option fonts menu. Anyone knows how to get to the fonts menu? Okay. I, I don't remember. But you can <laughs> go from tools, options, and then you can look for that, right? But there is an easier way now. Uh, I do control Q and I get to this small little search box in the corner of um, IDE and I just say fonts and I hit oh. enter and then I get that thing right away, right? And then here I come and look for um, C++ tokens. So here are all these tokens, uh, you can, be, you'll see some of the colors uh, which are different than black by default, but let's say you want to change, I want to go, let's say make uh, local variables look, say, uh, maroon, right? I can do that, and all my local variables will now become uh, maroon, right? So here, this is a local variable, and it's in a different color. So if your coding style uh, is helped by changing a certain semantic <coughs> change to form, uh, for, uh, from consolos to something else, yeah. Well, I mean, from courier to yeah, anything. Yeah, that you, you could always do. No matter. But for different tokens, yeah, you can do that. For different tokens. Yeah. So. Um, Right. So, so now let's uh, uh, let's go look for uh, the file, the what function we were at. Right. We were at uh, on key down. Right? So now look at this new uh, find. Uh, there's no longer that dialog that sits over your code. Instead, you have a um, in edit for that. Or off the screen. Or off the screen. Of mine, <laughs> the, 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 the auto positioning kept moving, right. making the dialog huge. And moving. Exactly. So that was a bug. Yeah, the screen. Exactly. <laughs> None of that. Go on, right? Instead, what you have is an in editor adornment, which you know is at a consistent location, always there, unobtrusive, uh, doesn't hinder your workflow, and uh, it is a little bit smarter. So as I start typing, it matches. Uh, right, uh, all the things and it highlights those. And if I just hit enter, I go to the next instance of the match. Uh, so, I, so and and uh, so, so here, this is what I was looking for, and I'm here. And let's spend a couple more minutes on the file itself. Uh, so you can do all the things that you uh, have, you know, uh, used it for the uh, used. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So you can do all uh, fine and replace and everything. And it supports the uh, regular expressions as before, but the regular expression engine has improved a little bit. Uh, so it's, it uses a different uh, .NET style uh, regex engine instead of the old POSIX style. So let's say I want to do, I want to uh, look for all the numbers in this uh, source file. So I, d, I do a slash D. And then it has the eight here, but the two here is uh, highlighted. And then I uh, hit enter and I go up. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get back to find a little bit later, but the good thing is you have find everywhere, wherever the editor is, even in the out, uh, output box. Uh, we saw that working in the DGML uh, graph itself, yes. What if you wanted to search the whole solution? Can you still do that? Uh, so this is fine for the particular, find and files are still it's there. Fine. Find and files are still there, but searching for whole solution, we already have a couple of other uh, ways to do it. Uh, let's say I was in this file and are you familiar with control comma or navigate to? Uh, so this was a feature which was added in uh, 2010, but 
not a lot of people know about it, but people who know about it, they really love it. So let's say I want to search uh, for um, yeah, that's what on looking for key data, the same thing that I was looking Immediately I get this. So it searches across all the, the symbols, car. all the file names, everything in your entire solution, even across languages. You can this is in the whole, it's kind of so I can, I can uh, uh, constrain that to everything in the project, everything in the solution. Uh, you cannot filter that. It, it, it's always scope to the whole solution. But you, uh, you can hide external items. Let's okay. say yeah, right? two million lines of code. Okay, so and that's it's very smart. That's why it'll immediately get you. So the important thing is, do you get the the, the right searches on top or not? You don't care whether the ten thousand ones is. is right? So it, try that. A lot of people, whoever uses it, loves it. Um, there's another way to search your entire solution, which I'll get back to in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so again, where was that function that I was? Uh, Right. So I come here. Um, so I realize this is where the bug is. I am actually not handling the keystrokes here. So uh, I'll do some typing here. Observe as I type. I want to type a switch statement. So I start typing. I press S, W, and I didn't press Control Space or Control J. The member list immediately popped up automatically. Right and as I type, it filters and it matches to the right thing, and I get switch here, right? So let's see, uh, so I hit tab, and what it did is, uh, it typed the boilerplate code to it. So we now have code snippets, about time, right? <laughs> um, so we have code snippets for the, uh, the regular boilerplate type things, for loops and uh, search and other things. But if you have suggestions for more, uh, the um, you know, code snippets that we should have, please let us know. You can actually go and add your own code snippet also. It's very easy. It's The code snippet is just an XML file uh, that follows a certain schema. You can go and add your code snippet. Can I remove them? Uh, you can remove them, yes. You can remove specific code snippets. These are just XML files in a certain location. You just go delete that and it'll be gone. You don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Can you modify the built-in like for switch if you want to change the code snippet? Can you change it? Yes. Uh, so let's say now I want to uh, switch on PS, so I do uh, PS, and and I hit enter, and all all the enum values, the case statements for all the enum values are going to be uh, Imagine there being 50 enum values, we saved at least uh, you know, minutes of your voting time, right? And all there is that you can write. Um, so there are other ways to invoke, other than the number list. Uh, you can go and uh, see the edit menu. You can uh, insert snippet. And you can, so you, if you do insert snippets, you get all the snippets that are already there. And you can also do a surround uh, snippet. You select, uh, make a selection, and then you go and do uh, surround with, and then it'll give you the same thing, and it surrounds it. <laughs> all right. Uh, moving along. Um, let's say uh, I start typing now, right? So I need to type a function to handle uh, this, this button. Uh, this case, right? And I don't remember what it was. I vaguely rem uh, remember that it was something center previous or something. So what I do is I type P and then send. Look at this. Uh, pay attention here. Pre-send is not a substring or a prefix or a camel case operator thing, right? It, but it's still found it. So it's pretty smart to figure that out. What it uses is, uh, is an approximate uh, string match algorithm, commonly known as the fuzzy search. Um, so even if you don't, it, it doesn't need the prefix or those things, so it can do this, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have preset and I see the member list is showing me the match. I don't want to type the rest of it. I don't even want to correct anything. I just do open paran and the rest of it is automatically completed. Mm -hmm. And I close it. So now uh, a lot of people may like it or may not like it. If you don't like this, uh, completion on a certain character, depending on how your uh, typing behavior is, you can go and customize it. Again, uh, uh, going back to the favorite uh, search box here, you just say C++, uh, C++ IntelliSense, second type, right? And you get this menu. And here, you have all the options that you uh, ever need to uh, make changes in the uh, IntelliSense behavior. So this is where the completion character was. So if you remove uh, open paran from here, it will not complete. 
or if you want to add some, a lot of people don't like uh, this, especially if you do a lot of uh, template, templatized code, so you can remove that. And this, the memory list filtering mode is fuzzy by default. You can change it to something else if you want. If you don't want any memory list filtering, so you can just remove it. So I have, I have a specific uh, question about IntelliSense. Um, and, and remember, I'm not using 2010. Mm -hmm. I'm just using 2008, so you may have fixed it in 10. I, I had a, a, I've always had a problem in that I add all the libraries uh, that I'm linking to the uh, particular module I'm in, and it sometimes will find my find symbols in the other modules. It will sometimes even find things that I pointed to with the shared pointer. But when I right click on the pound include, it will never find the pound include where. Even though that pound include was what I had to use to to uh, define the symbol. In other words, the symbol is defined in that pound include, it, it and it knows it because it, it can complete it. But it, it shouldn't happen. But having said that, there were a lot of bugs in in 2008, 2008 to 2010. We have a whole new uh, intelligence engine, uh, totally different okay. architecture. So. In all probability, that has been fixed. But if you show me after this or uh, later, uh, we can just try it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go to some more typing. Uh, again, here uh, I don't know what it was. It was uh, next center or something. Again, so many people popped up, uh, and and as I type, it filters and it shrinks your memory list to just two things here, right? Um, and I see. So this is one more thing here. Um, Question. Yeah. Does control L, control Alt, space still switch to the to the don't automatically select the uh, most likely match mode? I mean, there's uh, in 2010, mm -hmm. IntelliSense had two modes. Mm -hmm. One was uh, use existing things, and the other one was basically on added on demand, test driven development. I see. I see. And so if you press Control out space. It switches between those. Two. I see. So um, does it still exist? Yeah, it still exists. We haven't changed any of those. And and in the end, you file it by your browser. Okay. <laughs> and even even in the next uh, bit that you will see in public release, uh, the behavior has slightly changed in terms of how it is selected, whether it's selected automatically or not. So let's let me show you another. If you wanna see what what changes you are making and how does it compare to the thing in your source control. Uh, how do you do that? You go use Vendor for some other tool, right? So let's say I want to do uh, compare. And I want to compare it with, you can now do diff in the editor itself. All right? Um, yes. All right? Just team server, I assume, or is it plugin? Uh, it, is team, uh, it is TFS, but then you don't have to go buy the expensive gazillion dollar TFS. Now, if we have something called I, TFS that's online, nice, but we really don't care. We have our repositories in the Mercurial. Uh, so, so <laughs> this, this, this time, this, this yeah. release, you, uh, you cannot plug in any of the source yeah. control. But if you have, uh, maybe in your case it doesn't work. But for anybody who wants mm -hmm. it, and now you have TFS online. So actually, I'm using that. Uh, what I'm using here is uh, I created in, in minutes uh, my own uh, TFS service online. Right? You, all that you need is uh, uh, a live ID and you can create it. So it doesn't work with the, the It doesn't work with other source control, yeah. But the others will check how checking works. Just do it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh. So it's the source control. How do you call speed? Source control uh, totally on this, it doesn't work with us. Okay. But the, the deep as well? Okay. That's fine. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. uh, so, so not only can you see the diff here, you can actually, this thing is a fully live editor. Uh, you, you see all the colors here, and you can you get full um, intelligence and everything. So you can start typing, and then uh, you get a little support in the queue. I'll see that. Yeah, uh, you can see the inline mode if you want, and you can uh, <coughs> you can see side by side and all that, right? Um, so uh, let's close this. Now I have uh, 
uh, completed this, I think I'll fix this bug. Uh, there's one thing that I didn't talk about. So if I select, if I put my cursor on a particular symbol, all the matching references are highlighted. And I can navigate between the uh, matched references using a keyboard shortcut. Um, and this is not just a string match, it is actual references, right? So uh, let's say I have case, let me just prove that to you. If I say I enter uh, int ks equal to 10 right outside, uh, and I select this, it only matches these two things if you can make all the uh, algebra here. So it, it, it only matches this case and it does not highlight this case. Now let's say I uh, comment this out, and then I select this, then you see that this is now highlighted also. So I figured out that, so it's not just string match, right? It's actually the proper references. Now by the way, you saw that the color changed here from black, uh, from maroon to black. So that's another way semantic colorization helps you in debugging. So let's say you were expecting a local variable there in, in Firestake, you commented this out immediately, you can tell by looking that something's wrong. Um, anyhow, um, uh, so, so now let's fill this again, and hopefully this bug should have been fixed. So after this, what we'll uh, uh, do is we'll look at the Solution Explorer. The Solution Explorer has completely changed. Uh, let, let's get to that after this fills. I have built 15 times <laughs> and never did it take to, to this long, but anyway. Uh, so I go and tell this again. And, and now when I press uh, these down arrow keys, and, uh, so it, it, it's doing the right thing, so I'm going to fix. All right. Uh, so I talked about finding in the output file also. Where let's say I to here, and then I say, uh, um, you know, code, whatever, everything is back, you know, all the matches are done, you can do uh, the rich interactions there also. Um, let's uh, switch to uh, the Solution Explorer. Uh, what you see here is not very different, uh, but we realize that uh, from the current Solution Explorer, but we realize that in the course of your work, you have to interact with a lot of tools and work. You use Solution Explorer for looking at the files, you go to final references for looking at references, you go to call hierarchy window for seeing the call hierarchy, you do navigate to for searching for symbols across the solution and so on, right? We try to consolidate all of that in one window which is the new solution explorer. So here, not only can I uh, look at the files, I can actually uh, get into the files and let's say I have this error, uh, if I like go into it, I can inspect the types and, and, and so let's say I drill into the type and I can see all the members and everything in that. Uh, so whatever you used to use class view for, you can do that. And let's say I want to do right click here and I can get calls, is used by, is called by, solve the call relationship. Uh, one disclosure here, uh, so these three relationships may or may not be supported fully uh, by the time uh, this thing RPMs. We found some uh, bugs and we're trying to work on it, but it may or may not be um, so, so final references, calls, and everything is, 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 is not. Now you can search the whatever I, uh, uh, you asked, the, what do I use to, for searching a cloud solution? You can do that from here also. So I say, let's say I want to search for the same function that I was uh, on. Right? Uh, so, uh, it, it searches, uh, and I can hide the external dependency here, so I, I can just get to the right uh, methods from by searching here. All right, so you give back to your home, and um, what you can do is, you can create a new instance of, uh, let's say, uh, I can create another instance of Solution Explorer if you want. Um, and then let's say uh, I want to zero in on this particular thing in, um, in this instance and something else in uh, this instance, you can do that. Um, so let me show you uh, some more things that you can do with uh, the document management. Uh, so it will be a little bit hard for me to do it. Uh, 
uh, and this resolution, but I will try to uh, simulate a multi-mon uh, environment. Um, so let's say I, this is my first monitor. <laughs> and <laughs> so I tear this out and I put it in the second monitor, which is this part of the screen. I can tear this another file. And tear this out and I can drop it here, right? And then I have, uh, let's say I take uh, another instance of Solution Explorer and then I dock it here as well. So it is almost another instance of Visual Studio for you, even though it's just one dev and running, right? And you also get um, the arrow, um, you know, it, it, it shows up as a separate window, yes? And I open the same file in both windows here? Yes, you can. And, uh, and then, so when you're done, so, so you, you could be working in one project in here, another project in here. Yeah, so I want you to open one source file. Yeah, the main, yeah. Say main that's, frame that's right. I'm not very Let's say I have this here, and I get it, and I put it here, and I open this again. Now I do that. Just same file there. Why would you do that? Because of I do it a lot. I, I, I kind of do you know, refactoring or code moving or just, I have two functions in a file, and I want to look at one while I write the other. And I mean, I've, I've got the splitter for one, but I prefer having them side by side and not on top of you each other. You should use the diff. Integrate the diff now. <laughs> that actually works in 2008. Like I do that a lot. Yeah, but it's a split you into the I can split vertically. Okay. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you can do it. It just, at least you always have been able to do it. Yeah, you just, you can always do it. I know, but you just need to, like that. Yeah. Usually it's a mistake when I do it. Select and yeah, now split vertically. Huh? Sorry? Yeah, Start a split and you should be able to switch the split, right? Wait. Uh, is that Click on the tab. Click, uh, That's right. We can, uh, so we're going to go to the same screen. Uh, so here's your two, two screen thing, right? So And then you close the solution explorer and then you control double click here. All your files come back to the get dot in the original thing there. So now, let's say I have uh, you know uh, tens and hundreds of files open. You can now pin the specific specific files that you want to keep open. And so now all of those new files that are open, they'll be open somewhere else. And the f files that you are interested in are all within this one designated location. And if I want to do close, but all, uh, close all but pin, I can do that. Everything else gets closed. Uh, yes. Just just a comment on, on mentioned multi monitor support. It's hard to underestimate or I mean overestimate how important that is yep. to, to me anyhow, and I think yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, developers. Absolutely. That so actually, have a feature request for that. Let's talk about that right after this. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Suma, you know, you're going to show the cool. Uh, I think it's a new left right thing when you're debugging. If you debug and you step in something, it opens up the file on the right yes, side. Yes, that's, that's a nice, good, good question. Okay, cool. So let's say like that. All right. So, so I've closed all the files and I am in this solution, right? I, in this file, and in the solution, I now go to the next one. The next file open, but I don't see any tabs for that. The file is opening in a reusable area in your document well called preview tab. Uh, as I go to the next file, the next file open there, my document well is not getting cluttered, right? So imagine the situation in, in a debugging side, you're stepping through your code and you're opening a bunch of new files, and then suddenly your document well is cluttered with a hundred files that you're not interested in, none of that happens. Uh, if you'd notice when I did F12, the file opened in this tab also. But if you're wondering what happened to the history, all the history of the file is maintained here. You can go back to whatever file was open, right? And as soon as you, let's say I type something, we understand that you are in trying to interact with this file in a more uh, prominent basis, so we promote it to what is called a prominent tab. You could have also uh, done this so <coughs> by using a button here, just say open this, and then it, it gets promoted to it. <coughs> right, like this? 
so we talked about um, so 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 yeah right. Can just at one point when you were typing, the, what's the name of the feature where it, 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 it real time detects you've made an error and puts a little squiggly red line under it? Right, that's the intelligence live errors. The squiggles is a the The squiggle order. thing, yeah. the squiggle feature. I, I find that incredibly useful. It saves a vast number of compiles. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know what powers that? That's the EDG file. Well, that's okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. that, this, that's my question, though. It works great as long as. You, I mean, basically, what they've got going is two compilers under yes. there, and the damn. The t as long as the two compilers agree, <laughs> it's fine. But there are cases where you'll get a squiggly red line, and you you bang your head trying to figure out what's wrong. And then you say, "Well, I'll try to compile anyhow," and the compile works, because the you know you know the problem. Right. I'm sure. <laughs> so yeah, is that fixed in 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 eleven? Uh, so we have been nibbling at it one error at a time where there is disparity between EDG and our compiler and but have we eliminated it completely? No. It's, it's, it's not just one bug, feature. it's every is time the compiler show the feature? Oh, um, the live error? Oh, this is one of the coolest things. In is this, I mean, is this a 2010 thing? Yeah, it's, it's 2010. Yeah, it's incredibly cool. Yeah. When you're writing code from scratch, well, just it's okay on writing, my but on writing code from scratch, it's really cool. Let me let me show you that. Yeah. But oh, by the one cool thing I forgot to uh, show you. Um, all right, so right here, uh, so let's say I have this uh, function that I just wrote, and I uh, want to use this thing in um, in another place. So I start typing on. Srand, you're using Srand, you're killing me. Mercy what? Twister. What? Sorry. Get a function down there. Okay. I'm just bitching about it. So, yeah, so, so it, watch, so this is a, oh yeah, this thing. <laughs> so this is, this is the squiggle that you're talking about. So you see the uh, red on the lines oh, here? Oh, I see. something wrong with this. Right. Um, all right, so as I start typing this, I open this, and I see that my parameters are highlighted, right? But uh, and the, I see a signature, but then that's about it. I don't get any additional rich intelligence like you get in C sharp or something. Um, some of the, uh, the nomadic language. We have addressed that. Uh, let me show you. So, so if I go and now, I'll actually put in some documents. Uh, uh, let's So right here, I go and um, add this comment in the rich uh, XML uh, doc comments format. Uh, let's just to prove that it's right. Let's change this. Uh, say boost on here. Right, that's the comment. So now I want to use OKDE. Let's say right, and I get the thing. So now uh, look at this. Uh, if I start typing, I get a richer uh, intelligence uh, two tick here. This function processes the error key inputs, and the first parameter is, you know, I just added boost on, and it goes to the next one, maybe out to the next one, right? Uh, so I, uh, right. nice, all right, good. Uh, so for the people who, who are the library developers here, if your library uh, is just a header-based library, and your all your implementations are in the header, like uh, most of the boost libraries are, if you just Write your comments like that, the experience and the ID will be vastly rich. Yes. The comments are in Doxygen 5. And do I get any benefit? You, you, if you have any comments at all in any style, mm -hmm. you will get that comment in the toolkit. But it doesn't recognize the backslash P. No. Uh, is there any way to move these bloaty bloat comments out of the main chunk of source code? Like, can I have all my beautiful yes. code up top and then? Horrible comment declaration, horrible comment declaration at the bottom or something. Because uh, no, no, there's a lot of stuff in the concurrency runtime headers. And I, over my dead body, will we put this in the SDL? <laughs> like, as if it polluted the main source code. Uh, Does so it just key off the declarations, or must it be on the definition? Sort of uh, definition. It must be on the definition, oh. if it is in the source. But there is another. If you, you can create an XML doc comment file. Which is a separate XML file. Oh. And if, okay. But it is there's some caveat. It doesn't work for 
regular C++ file set for for binmd based things or oh, metadata okay, based things. Nothing to that. <laughs> so there's an XML file which it knows how to associate it with a particular binary, and then it, it goes and looks for the binary. But okay. I, thought you, I thought you could put it in the uh, header file. Yes, you can put the stuff in the header. What, I, what I'm wondering is, because go, go back to your comment. So, up, up. yeah, yeah. Okay. See, this is like local float, especially if your functions are very, very tiny. Your file becomes sixty percent horrible triple slash comments. Yeah. I was wondering, yeah, maybe I want to do this for users, but I don't want to look at this myself when I'm editing code. Have to be Could I just have this thing mm -hmm. attached to a declaration? Uh, so and just have maybe at the end of my file, or even at the beginning, um, just comment declaration, comment you, declaration. So the main chunk of my code is another solution would be: Can you just have the triple things automatically uh, close the minus thing when you open your file? That would yeah, well, no, so slightly that would, help. Yeah, click on, click on the minus, yeah. except yeah, except I don't edit through the IDE. I don't want that at all yeah. in the physical file if it's in line. So not in this release, but in the next release, for all kinds of uh, not, not just metadata based oh, files. Be the it, separate it, XML it, thing. We will support separate XML. Okay. 2015 or I don't know. <laughs> VC12. I mean, just VC12. Whatever the number is. VC next. Right. So. But it doesn't work on the big stuff. It doesn't work on the big It does work on the big stuff. All right. So let's switch gears here. I'm running behind, so I might not be able to go anything. Have a seat. There are lots of questions. So. What did we see? Uh, we see saw, let's quickly recap over everything that we saw. Enhanced intelligence, um, semantic colorization, reference highlighting, uh, code snippets in action, new find, XML doc comments, diffing in the editor, um, the overall UI simplification, uh, color comment, um, we have uh, understood when we are doing something about it, new solution explorer, we saw dependency graphs, we saw various uh, document management and multi one type features, preview tabs. And search everywhere is that something that I didn't show. But now basically you can um, see, you know, search within your error list. So let's you have a thousand errors. Sure that, okay. that was that was right. fine. Don't and yeah, the search. Let's say you have. Oh, search is not fine. Good. Okay. <laughs> search is not fine. <laughs> so, I'm like the clueless user here. Okay. So. <laughs> so so what you can do is you can filter your error list also. And you can in the error list. Let's say you are interested in just a particular. Uh, File you can do that. It's nice for a string. Um, all right. Um, who likes these kind of things in their apps? You like it? <laughs> uh, That's awesome. So, uh, I was never interested. I like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no one likes it. We don't like it. There's some Microsoft ones here, so obviously we're not very happy about it. But the problem is, uh, it's very hard to find uh, these kind of things. Uh, oftentimes your code will be fine, and the testing doesn't get it. The buffer overruns. You know. Uh, uninitialized memory and those kind of things. Static analysis helps you with that. It's a very useful feature. It has been in the previous release, but in this release, we have vastly improved this. Um, let's go to that demo. I'll show you how we have improved it. Um, so here I have a uh, again. So I just built it. It builds fine, right? Um, but if I run it, I'll get a bunch of errors um, uh, at, at runtime. Um, so we have the, the analysis engine itself has improved. The accuracy of the engine has, has gotten better. We have added much more uh, you know, other warnings and other errors that we can. So it's much richer. And we have, we may, it's mandatory for uh, you know, within the products in Microsoft to use this. Windows uses it, we use it, so based on what we find in our products, we constantly improve it. So in this release, it is, it is vastly, vastly improved. Uh, in addition to that, it's much easier to use it. Um, so what if, you're, if you use this in uh, 2010, you got the analysis, just the simple error type thing. And in the output window, it was very difficult to understand why the analyzer thought that this was a problem. So in this release, First of all, it is um, exposed very prominently in the right in the build menu. You do run code analysis. <coughs> and what you see is a separate um, code analysis tool window. Uh, so it has, again, search. I said search everywhere. So what you see is uh, all the 
analysis reports here. And you can search and you can filter. So I, want to, I could have run it just for a specific project or for the entire solution. This has just one uh, project in the solution. Uh, you can uh, filter. So I just say I want to do uh, index. I'm looking for those kind of things only when everything else uh, got removed. So what happens in a real life project, you have hundreds and hundreds of things, and it's very difficult to wait through all of that and figure out where the right thing is. If you're interested in only your file or a specific thing, it's very easy to uh, do it through this. Um, so let's say this one. So what it does is uh, it's a simple I deliberately wrote this artificial code, and here uh, the buffer is over on the situation, it catches that. Uh, another situation is in this code, we, I am dereferencing a null pointer. Even though it built successfully, it caught that. Not only does it catch that, it also shows you how it exactly did it analyze that and how did it reach there. Right? So it uh, figured this out and then it finally says, here is where I think it. So it's now very easy for you to understand and fix it and do something. <coughs> yes? Uh, and the command line output, um, not just the ID, I mean, it's all this info, right? I'm not very positive. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember seeing like yeah. line 40, comma 50, but I yep. don't remember seeing all of this, but I haven't looked at an analysis point. I haven't now. tried that recently. Okay. okay. Yes? It was on the action menu. Okay, good. Good question. Um, let me show that. In a because of what I wanted, uh, maybe you just acknowledged a warning or error. I will show that in a minute. Okay. Uh, yes? Uh, does it, does it uh, take into account that service? So if I do an as a function entry and assert entran is larger than 10, so that branch could never be taken. Would it? Yeah, assert is only deeper, right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, I could say I, actually think I don't care about the, that it's not possible in the release version because I'm going to get I actually it. believe that the assert will make analysis happy because as I remember, if you use the CRT's assert, even in release mode, it will expand to the special analysis assume macro that tells code analysis hey, go assume this thing is true, because the user told me to. I'm like 90% sure that the CRT does I just know what Clang does. And Clang static analyzer takes an assert as, Assume. the user as basically at, at the assertion point, it says, hey, it might say, hey, but I know that it definitely will fail. But if it doesn't know that, it's going to assume that it's uh, tapped. Yeah. And the, the, key, the key word for static analyzer is assume. So Stefan might be right that we just folded into the macro. Yeah, there's a special. So so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain we have this analysis assumed in incantation. I'm also absolutely certain that we use it in the SQL in various places. I'm like 90% sure that the just the CRT plain old assert macro will emit one of these. Um, of course, you can use it by hand, but I'm pretty sure you would have to go look at the yeah, thing to so memorize the CRT. Thing about okay, I have a feature request. Um, and this is very dependent on what it's the other the extreme for multi monitors, but you go down to a small laptop or something. I want to be able to toggle line numbers on and off. I want a button to toggle them on and off. I do um, not want to have to go into my options and find the editor option. Okay. Uh, uh, consider that, but with this new quick launch, quick launch thing, it is substantially easy. Just say line number. Mm, right? Yeah, no, that that's, but but still, if I'm doing it repeat, and I'm yeah, in I situations guess. where what I really want to do is do it like in, in presentations and things mm, like that. Yeah, uh, control K, you, you, mark, you mark the line, you control No, control mm -hmm. the line number, show line number. Ah, uh, show the line number? Yeah. yeah. We have buttons for everything, why not that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can probably easily do it with a macro. And now assign that back to sh uh, with a shortcut key. Yeah. Bad news for you. Uh, uh, I, I remember. <laughs> remember, I, I remember. I only use the. Uh, I, I only use the. Uh, uh, express version. The express edition, and so I don't have some of those no, tools. I, I did not play a role in removing that. Yeah, you guys have removed macros? What? Yes. From the editor? Yes. No. You're kidding me. No, no. It doesn't support preprocessor right? No, no, no. Visual Studio. Visual Studio. Visual Studio. Visual Studio. Edit, <laughs> editor macros. Oh, oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, then, answering your question. Uh, so what is the action? So let's say I looked at this and I don't really care if it was a false error or something. I can suppress this right from here in the code and I'll never get that error again. I just introduce this one pragma warning and this thing will, will, will die. Suppress is new. No, it's actually not new. It's not new. No, uh, we've had it ever since analyze. It only works for analyze warnings, and it's a single line. It says shut up the next one. Oh, so yeah. it's not like a whole single okay. block. And it doesn't work for compiler performance. I don't believe it works for the 4000. Uh, there you do need to use it. That's another example. Let's look at this. Um, we have a, um, a SAL annotation guarded by, so uh, we're using here. So, and uh, this particular um, variable was supposed to be hired by that, and I'm not doing it right, right? so I got this thing, uh, this condition. So all that I have to do is I remove this and put it here. So let's run this again. Yes, sir. Did the cell uh, uh, guys in their infinite wisdom extend this to student mutex, or did they only hard code uh, with her two critical sections and maybe concert? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm suspecting the answer is no, because nobody ever asked it. But maybe the answer is yes. <laughs> so I rebuild this, and I am analyzing this again. And now the thing that I suppressed, I don't see that the race condition has been fixed. All right. Um, Are you going to mention the best thing about static analysis? The very best thing? Right. The fact that it is no longer a premium plus. It is now oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. shipped in professional, which is the not thousand dollars queue. Not only and that. A subset of it is an express for yes. free. Yes. I never thought they would do that. So, <laughs> yes. Thank you. So it, everything in UI and everything is supported in Express also, just the room set is uh slightly uh are are being able to draw uh Margin lines, I forget the name of the feature. Is that in Express now? Line numbers? No, the, uh, there's been a feature for years. It used to be right. so hidden because it was put in there just for me, but every other editor in the world has had this since I don't know when, that you can do a, draw a grayed out line or in a, at a certain column, and you use that for meeting coding guidelines. Yeah, you can, you can and, put it in, but you, can't, but you can't do it to the user interface. I, I actually have that in 2000. Well, well, no, wait, wait. They ch they change it in every edition. They change this. There's a you secret know. reg key, right? I mean, yeah, you're asking a, me about There is a this. secret reg key. Uh, they nuked it in like 2010 or something stupid. So, they nuked yeah. it. Yeah, they really did something stupid. Yeah, I, I like to get that. It actually seems good. I don't use it myself. I use the IE because Nicomer has got an 80 column restriction, and I constantly blow past it. And the scope has to go reformat my code. I mean, it, what's so amazing about this? The, the, the lack of this feature is every other serious editor in the world has it. Well, well, it does have the feature. If you just put a pain in the butt to turn it on. No, no, no. It's lot certain editions and certain versions do not. Oh, is that right? Pull it out. Way, and play. It's, key and it's, just it's, all, it's not a real feature. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. I love the hidden stuff. Do you want to add your own static analysis rules and do that? No. Unless you're an STF. No, you cannot put uh, the the rules in the box itself are very, very rich. You can customize which rules do you run or not. You can select, you can create your own rule set, rule set file, but you cannot add your own. Yeah, yes. this is not like being driven by an XML file. This is a real compiler yeah, that yeah. is essentially emitting these high power warnings. So. Is it really going to ship with all caps in the menu titles? Uh, Let's avoid that question right now. <laughs> it's uh, it's I don't shouting know. at me. I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Why? This yeah. isn't fine. I, I have a question this about uh, this is code fine. formatting. I know in C sharp, it's kind of cool. You can like go to the top of your file and open bracket, close bracket, and it formats it nicely for you. And it never works for C plus plus because it hasn't was never added. Is that ever going to be put in? Uh, so we have done a lot of code formatting related fixes, but. Uh, because I could write, I could write a really crappy function that's all bad and just go close bracket and it fixes it all in C sharp. So you can do control K K F, control yeah. K F, will do that. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Will but, it? Yeah. yeah. Control K F has always been there. Oh, just, just highlight a section control K F. Yeah. format. But but then there are other things that C sharp does that we don't do. Uh, we haven't done all the formatting related changes in this release, but that's something. Else. 
One more question. And then okay. um, for the static analysis, I know we've had problems with other static analysis tools. Um, in our code base, we have a certain type of assert that they don't catch as exiting the system and being a path that kills it. Is there a way to add in anything like that with the current static analysis that's in there? It's, uh, I forgot the spelling. I think it's underscore capital analysis, underscore assume, underscore. Um, we've got it in a few places in the STL. I can actually find it pretty easily. Um, and it's documented somewhere. You just need to add this to your assert macro, maybe under an if def and see her, and then that'll tell the static analysis tool. Okay. Uh, or I think we have an assert function, so I'll probably just put it down inside that function. Oh. Well, uh, if it's inside the function, mm -hmm. the static analysis will not go inside the function. Oh, it won't go no, into the one? It's not. Uh, but your okay. probably going through a macro anyways. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it's being right. set up, but... Uh, <laughs> all right, so switching context here. So whenever we talk to customers and ask for, tell me what is the most valuable thing in VS for you. Uh, debugger almost always is at the top. Uh, if not, the only type of uh, So uh, we've added uh, quite a few uh, enhancements in this release also. But I'll not talk about everything. I'll talk about a couple of specific uh, debugging features, especially for uh, parallel and GPU development. But before that, I have to. Um, how many of you have heard about C++ AMP here? C++ what? AMP. Good. You haven't heard about it. Okay. Uh, so it's a few. Uh, all right. So that I'll, what I'll do is uh, I'll do a quick uh, uh, primer about it. Um, so all of us have heard this story, uh, the power of uh, heterogeneous computer. Uh, here's a slide from NVIDIA that shows the applications in different domain have uh, had you know, orders of magnitude perf improvements by leveraging GPU. So what, if your algorithm has a bunch of uh, data parallel type operations, uh, where you basically crunch a lot of numbers, uh, but they're not uh, dependent on each other, you can offload it to GPU and your CPU is free to do other things, and you gain a lot of perfect benefits. Um, so uh, we uh, ran a, a, a direct space simulation, uh, which is a, a simulation of, of, of a dynamic system of n bodies interacting in the um, influence of each other's gravity. And so this is a very uh, commonly used example for a um, data parallel uh, algorithm. So what you see here is uh, that we are using all the six cores of CPU, we, uh, this uh, program uh, used uh, PPL, uh, and so, but at about, but still it's maxed out at about 31 gigaflops, and it's getting uh, 14, 15 uh, frames per second. Uh, in the ne uh, in the next uh, picture, what you see is we are using uh, same program, uh, running on the same desktop, uh, but using uh, leveraging uh, GPU. In fact, not just one, two GPUs. How we do that is somewhat of the magic that I'll talk about. And what you see here, all the CPU is almost free for you, and you're getting one teraflop almost, and 121 frames per second, and almost the, for double the number of bodies. Uh, so all good. What's what's the problem that we are trying to solve? The problem is, um, in order for you to uh, leverage GPU, you have to go learn a special compiler, special language, of course, special tools, and all of that uh, for what is essentially a very small portion of your code, uh, the data parallel parts of it, right? And because of that, it is not becoming very uh, mainstream, as mainstream it, as it should be. That's what we are trying to solve. So enter AMP. Uh, C++ AMP is accelerated massive parallelism. Uh, <laughs> Um, what it does is it uh, lets you leverage all the accelerators, including GPU, uh, like GPUs. Uh, so what it is, it, it's part of the Visual C++, the familiar compiler that you're uh, used to. Uh, there, it comprises of some uh, language changes, I think just two language changes, and a bunch of uh, library changes. These are STL type libraries. And it is very tightly integrated into Visual Studio, that's what we're going to talk about. And it builds on top of Direct3D, that's where a lot of portability comes from. Uh, if if a GPU device supports Direct 3D, then you, uh, you, you get the benefits. Uh, and we have, we, are, we have released this as an open spec, so any other compiler vendor could potentially uh, implement this, and they can use whatever else. We have, we have implemented it over Direct 3D. Uh, so you get 
the performance, the productivity of not having to go learn different uh, language and tools and everything. And um, of course, you get portability to even the next three. Um, so let's quickly go through. Yes. Uh, Skewed, is it Express Plus, Pro Plus, Premium Plus? Everywhere? It's part of the compiler. It's, it's okay, it's so always available. It's okay. It's not like, say, MFC ATL, where it's libraries, but it's only professional files. OK. Um, so let's quickly go through some code examples. Uh, uh, I don't expect that you will learn AMP in this. Um, but I just want to, before I go and show the debugging features, I just want to uh, quickly run through some code. Uh, so here is an example of uh, you know, serial add array that runs on CPU. Um, and if I want to write an AMP version of it, this is all that you have to do. Just notice the change. Just this much. There is no setup code involved. You just include a header file. And, I, uh, and I'm using uh, this namespace to save some typing. These are some, uh, some types that are in those libraries that help you, uh, you know, wrap the data to be copied to the GPU. Uh, and then this uh, parallel for each is the entry point. What, and it takes two parameters. One is uh, the number of grids. So it's basically uh, saying run this lambda, uh, lamb this lambda uh, for each thread and run these number of threads. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, but is the keyword inside the grid change to M? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's old slide. Good, good catch. Um, so let's look at the uh, parts of it here. Change. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the various parts of the this this um, code here. The parallel for each is the entry point that says, "Hey, take the, the code inside the lambda, put it on the accelerator." Uh, extend it, uh, is the first uh, parameter for this uh, parallel for each. What it does is um, it gives you a sh number and shape of uh, you know, the number of threads that you want to run. Index is the thread ID uh, that's running this lambda. And the restrict amp is, what is, the, is the compiler chain that tells the compiler. So everything in that, uh, inside that lambda has to be able to run on uh, the GPU. So there are certain restrictions. Like I said, app, uh, GPUs are very good at doing one specific uh, arithmetic, but not versatile. For, uh, for, uh, to do other things, so it has to have that restrict AMP. Uh, array view is um, it wraps the data uh, to operate on the accelerator, the GPU, and these are the uh, variables that have been captured in that lambda from uh, from your rest of the code. And then it goes in there. Um, let's did look they, at yeah. They did they add a make array view because they haven't specified the type there. Is kind of lame. I the don't think they have done that. Okay, they should do that. So let's take a look at uh, this parallel for each a little bit more. Um, well, I actually explained all the things. So what? Uh, let's talk about what actually happens when 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 we hit this code. There's a lot of magic that goes on, right? Um, so when when this lambda hits the compiler, uh, what we do is. For the code inside uh, the Lambda, we generate HLSL code. HLSL is high-level shared language. For all, uh, uh, that's a language you use if you want to use direct compute APIs, which is part of DirectX. So we generate uh, HLSL. And then the HLSL compiler kicks in. And then it generates a byte code. Uh, that byte code is stuck in the binary that your application, uh, you know, the compiler builds for your application. And then in addition to that byte code, we stick in a underscore underscore kernel stub function, which basically what it does is it it, it prepares the pipeline to call the uh, direct text for you, so so that you don't have to do all that direct text um, uh, plumbing. Uh, so when your application is running on your customer's machine, it comes to that point, and then we that that under, underscore underscore kernel stub code calls direct text. And then gives that byte code to it, and then DirectX takes over, and then that byte code, and then DirectX then calls the GPU driver, which has its own way to understand everything, and so that's where, and then it passes the data to GPU, 
Um, and so as long as the GPU is uh, Direct 3D, no, uh, DirectX 11 co compatible, it will it, it'll, it'll be able to do it. So, so there's so much magic going on, right? So, and then the GPU gives the data back to, to uh, DirectX, DirectX then gives it back to you. Um, so having seen that, so, um, so this, this is just the general uh, parallel for you. But there is another concept called tiling, which is really advanced. Uh, I, I don't expect that uh, we'll get uh, a good understanding here. But uh, what happens is, uh, basically, um, the threads, we can make them uh, share some memory and gain some additional memory access efficiency by using so-called tile threads. So uh, you can, let's just understand that best right now, right? Um, so let's look at a tiled version of parallel for each. This is the regular uh, uh, parallel for each. In the tiled version, you uh, take tile extends as the input, uh, and you take uh, a tile index as the index for your uh, thread. Uh, we, the reason I am showing is this, this will be used in the debugging example that I showed. All right, let's go into the... <coughs> One thing you mentioned while I'm just bringing this up is the original code where you just had the linear, you know, CI equals AI equals BI. That actually is auto-vectorized now. That's for free. The oh. back end does that for you and takes advantage of SSC2, whatever. And that's pretty cool. So, and what, did, what, to, what, kind of, what are the typical impacts you see from that? Um, it will increase the size of your generated code because they actually need to emit both the vectorized SSC stuff and the plain code if the processor doesn't support SSC or if the um, uh, pointers are misaligned. Uh, but you can get substantial speed ups. Uh, because those SSC instructions can eat, you know, 128 bits at a time, or uh, potentially larger. So, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, as of RTM, they will not interpret pointer-based loops. So, like STL-style loops, where you have uh, while uh, p equals begin, p not equal n <coughs> plus p. Uh, that's just a technical restriction because they see that pointer increment, and to them, it looks like incrementing an address by four, and they only handle increments by one right now. But that's an active bug. They know it's killing the STL and they're going to do something about it in the future. All right, uh, going to the, uh, the debugging features, right? So this, this is a simple matrix multiplication uh, program, just one source file. Uh, and the main icon, uh, matmul amp a function, uh, which is here. And it has a parallel for each. It is using a tile version of parallel for each. It says 16 by 16. That means there are 256 threads, and I want to use 16 tiles of 16 threads each. Uh, and this uh, lambda uh, calls a do it function here, which is this. And so that function also has restrict amp on it. So that's why this can be run on GPU also. Um, so it doesn't matter what the code does, but the important thing here is um, with all the magic that we talked about, under the code, uh, can you hit the breakpoint? Is the question because it's running somewhere else. Uh, so let's try that. Um, so this is uh, uh, resolution. <laughs> right, so yes, we are in the GPU code, and we are we were able to hit the. Um, Breakpoint here. Oh, um, <laughs> again? Yeah, we will. Let me get to that in there. But um, well, they, they yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so we are allowing you to debug at the expect at the abstraction level that you are actually coding, and we are hiding all of that underneath. So it took a lot of effort uh, to enable this. It seems a simple thing, but a lot of people are about very very hard on this. Um, so not only can you hit a breakpoint, you can uh, you can hit you can step through the board, right? And then uh, you can you get your all your autos, like all the favorite debugging features. Everything is working for it. Your locals, your volumes, and your watch window, right? Let's say. Let's uh, get to that in a minute. Uh, 
So let's add this to uh, add watch, and I get this value. You can add this one expression to it, and you get the value for that also, right? So now you want to see what's going. On. So which thread is in? So in, um, so 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 what you see here is in the call stack you see oh you math mul kernel stuff the code that we in, uh, enter for you calls this and and then this is one particular thread right and all these values are in one particular thread and here this parallel stacks window which has been there but, but that's also new yeah that's right yeah. yeah so this also it's shows the solution as well. yep. By the way, we're really sorry about this horrible lambda mangle names, but we have reasons for putting that horrible hash in there. <laughs> lambda zero one two is so pretty, but it breaks off this. All right, so so here the parallel stack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, so this this is one call stack, but in this parallel uh, stack, you see all the call stacks together. It shows that this one two hundred fifty six uh, six threads started here. And out of that, two hundred fifty two are on do it right now. Um, so let's remove this. So you talked about uh, threads. So we have a new uh, threads window for GPU threads. And, uh, GPU threads. So this. So here it shows the tile this thread this is running, and it shows the status of uh, your threads. All of these threads are active, and you can you can customize the column. Uh, you know, column so you you can freeze the thread, you can do whatever. Yeah. Uh, so let's say, since uh, a lot of these things are on do it, so I fill in, uh, put another breakpoint here. So here, uh, this is an, another uh, cool thing that we have. We've had it in Dev10 also, but um, it shows where the threads are in the source file. So can I change the value of the thread? Uh, in, in, sure. So let's. let's but, so what, does that change the value for all the. Uh, of the, uh, the thread? It's per thread, right? It's the same thread. So I want to see, uh, so let's say what's happening in thread number one. And so so right now it's it's, it's running thread uh, and then. Uh, and it goes to that thread and it, uh, the, all my locals would have changed now it's about, it's showing that th uh, thread ID and the value of some in that thread. Right. And so, so you can do one thread at a time, right? And then, so uh, let's let's F five again. And now I'm I'm here at the do it thing and see uh, uh, my GPU thread. Now it shows that four threads are active and four threads are at kernel stuff and all of that, right? So. You can inspect each thread using this thread window, but that's if in, in thousands of threads, you, that's not very helpful. So you have another thing here um, called uh, parallel watch. So now you can actually watch all the threads in this one tool window here, and you can add variables, right? So let's say I want to add, uh, so at watch, I want to do some. So it shows the value of sum in everything, all the threads, right? Um, not only can you do this, you can actually export to Excel. Let's see if I have Excel in this. I probably don't have Excel in this box. And this uh, parallel oh, launch do. works for CPU threads as well? Yes. Sweet. So it is not just GPU thread. Whatever we are showing works for CPU threads also. So you can export all of that in an Excel file and you know, do your analysis here. Well, yes. Oh, well, watch is really cool. Sorry. Say that again? Can you do a watch point where you say run until you hit this value yes, in any? Yep, all that. Okay. Um, so now, uh, and you can, uh, of course, search for uh, everything, right? You can have, so you can say sum equal to. Uh, it's fun to name that variable after yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you can do all this filtering and everything. And there are flags. So I say I want to flag this, uh, these four threads, which are at under, underscore underscore kernel thing. And then I show um, only show me only the flag ones, right? So it says, hey, none of the uh, things are here. Uh, 
Yeah. So let's let's say flag. I want to flag these four things, and then I want to filter everything. So your entire UI, the parallel stacks, parallel watch, the GPU threads, everything got filtered. Only those threads that you were interested in. Uh, so you can do a lot of those things here. It's full. Everything, all the familiar uh, debugging features that you like, plus some more. And they work for both CPU uh, threads and GPU threads. Uh, one more thing that I want to show is. Uh, and it's a new feature for a lot of people, so it's very useful, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So we think it's going to be useful. We think we named uh, you know, some of the workflow, but I'm sure some yeah. parts are okay. still not, not perfect. Yep. So one of feedback, use it. So let, let me show you one more quick debugging thing. Can this at the end of your time? Uh, okay. Because that is a debugger feature. Yeah. Um, so here, so in, in parallel uh, coding, uh, it is a very common mistake for people to forget to synchronize. Uh, so let's say I, uh, we, will, we will end that, that results in horrible situations, right? So we will help you with that also. Uh, so the debug exceptions, I can, Select this, right? So GPU memory access, access exceptions. I, I have selected that. And then I do F5. So it's here. And I do F5 again, and I get this exception. So I say, hey, you're, there's a potential race hazard. Um, and you can go fix it. Right? Um, all right. So that's. There, there are more things you can freeze threads, as Ali said, and a bunch of other things. Uh, freeze try it and uh, give us feedback. So you uh, you just open up your NAFIS file. Uh, there's no need to open something. Uh, I just open up your Windows Explorer. If you can find the start button, it's uh, like C program files. Um, X86. No, it's not under the X64. Visual Studio One. I usually just scroll the left one. Uh, Common Seven. Uh, packages. Debugger. Bugger. Visualize. Okay, actually, go go up one, please. Okay, so if, if anyone was it was kind of 2010 when I did my visualizer presentation. There's this autox.dat, that's the old style visualizers, those are bad. In this visualizer subdirectory, hey, there's all these new files like uh, stl.nafis. No, you can write. You can so write visualize. Um, we, we actually don't know the representations of uh, groups. Uh, so, but, so while this is a stupid thing loads, um, the old visualizer engine, it's, it was actually rewritten completely, and there's a new one. Uh, it's powered not by that custom horrible um, syntax, but by XML. Um, and the parser is now actually robust. It will not just fall over. Um, and although you got to escape your less thans, your greater thans, and your ampersands, it's much more powerful than before. You can do things that you could not do. Um, like even tuple, it doesn't choke on our fake variadic tuple anymore. Um, so we've actually rewritten in RTM. You'll see all the old STL visualizers have been completely rewritten in this new format. So you can look at that, for example. It's also actually going to be officially documented. Yeah. And like before when it was undocumented and get had to read my presentation to see. Um, it's composable. So Boost can actually now write a boost.nap is, and you can put it on their website. And users just need to stick it, I believe, next to their solution. Um, and then it'll actually pick it up. Because if you look, go back to the directory, um, there's no monolithic autox.dat, there's a, oh, the stupid extensions are being hidden, but there's an stl.nafiz, there's a concurrency.nafiz, atlnfc.nafiz, um, so in addition to these ones, you can have your own, and you don't need to stick it in the program files, it can be solution specific, and of course, your own app can have .nafiz. So I worked with, at first I was scared of the XML stuff, but aside from the whole escaping thing, it was actually a pleasure to work with. Yeah. Um, and
and and be, like like so we have blogged about it. We are going to document it. Yeah, it's going to be in the store somewhere. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Do you so still support the old format? It is, but that old engine is only used under a few circumstances. The most prominent one being if edit and continue is enabled. Mm -hmm. um, then, for technical reasons, the new engine is not used, uh, and they fall back to the old engine. Okay. Uh, so exactly. actually, we had to go update the old autox.nav is for all of our internal representation changes. So, so what I'm but editing continues off by default. What is this, what this is about is uh, Boost has some visualizers, and Clang has visualizers, and basically we can rewrite them for people. Yeah, and actually using the old style as a base of uh, writing the new ones okay. is actually how I did it. Okay. Um, all right, so we are almost over. But I have a bunch of other things to show. I, if, you, if you're willing to stay for another 10 minutes, I can try to cover this whole thing. Are you interested? Yeah. OK. All right. So let's, I'll walk faster than I have so far. So another thing, uh, another solution explorer type hub is um, Team Explorer Hub. Right? It is a location where all your work items are, are located, where all your pending changes, where all your source control things are, where all your uh, code review and other things are, right? So it's a new Team Explorer uh, window again. In, in this area. So there are different pages for it. You can look at your uh, work items. Again, this is working on TFS online that anyone can, can use without, um, and again, it, it doesn't work with other, other source control yet. Um, so, uh, so I'm not going to all of these details. You can you can explore if you want. But uh, what I wanted to show was uh, the code review request, which is relevant to uh, developers. So I want to do a request code review, and in this uh, TFS space, I have you know just my setup here. So I say test, and I and I submit request. Yes. So imagine I was in a different machine, I'm the reviewer, I get it. Um, so depending on the internet speed here, it is going and talking to my TFS server online, and um, it, it, it submitted this, right? So, so here, this is a review request that I uh, just submitted. Let's say I, um, I'm the one who got it. So you open this thing, and you can, um, you can open the files that um, were included in this, right? And you can see, although this is what was changed, you can see all the diffs here. Again, the same diffing tool comes in here, right? And let's say I'm the reviewer instead of the one who did it. Is I can add a comment here, add comment, and I say, if the comment gets here, hey, uh, I don't like this variable name, whatever, right? Um, and then I can save it. And you know, send comments. Uh, so the comments got sent, and I now, as a receiver, saw it, and I see this thing. Ah, there's a comment here, and this was this. I don't like the comment, and I can then reply. Uh, who cares, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, so this this work, uh, this code review workflow built right into the editor, right? And you don't have to do any context switching. So, if I so if I decide that. Right. I changed the variable yeah, name. Change the variable name. Yes. And you again, there's the same different thing. You can get, you can see the changes that yeah, that are there and make make uh, edits right in this, and then you get the full intent. So, on our system, we have potentially a half a dozen solutions uh, in a single uh, scope of a single uh, body of code work. Mm -hmm. um, so we can have this. Basically. As many solutions, as many files as you want. And you can associate work items. Let's say with this change, you're fixing this particular bug, so you can drag a work item from the work item thing that I just showed and say, yeah, this fixes this. Um, and then you can make, I make some changes here, and, and then I can. Do you have any integration at all with version 1 or any of the Scrum tools? Uh, version 1 of Scrum tools? What do you mean by that? That's uh, so, so, the answer. So, and then you can check in right from here, right? You can double check, yes. And also, it's part of the, you know, the other offering, the, you know, all the Scrum, you know. But you know what? Any integration with any of that stuff? I don't remember. Uh, we can check though. We'll okay. Okay, thanks. So, so you can edit, you can do check-ins and everything, right? 
Um, so it doesn't really matter. We don't have any information now. All right, so in the interest of time, I will not show all of these. There are other things. Uh, I will show you some unit testing support uh, that we have added in this week. Yeah. Yeah. Can I get? All right, so I will not go add the code um, because we are over. So what I have done is I, um, this is a CPP unit test framework that is now built in. And That's uh, getting namespace alias for MVC pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I can add a new uh, unit test template. There is a new unit test template here, so you can go and add this thing here. And I added this task. So the, with this application is just a simple calculator application, and all the uh, sort of functionality is in this this uh, file, and that's what I'm testing. So I'm testing add, for example. And so I have written this, and you can annotate your tests with with these um, uh, decorations, like. Uh, the test one is boost, and the priority is two. Sometimes uh, you don't uh, you don't want to run a test for whatever reason. You can add test ignore and those things. So now uh, we have a new window for uh, unit tests uh, right here. Uh, so here you can manage all your tests. Uh, you can run suppress and, and again search everywhere uh, theme. You can search your search and filter. Uh, uh, so this this is right now. I have just one test. Okay. Let me just uh, uh, build it. Um, so the, now the test appears here, right? So so I can go and say, hey, um, run selected test. Or I could have run all tests or other things. So it ran in less than a millisecond. Um, good, right? Um, so okay, right? So control R T work. I think run so. test in context. Run test in context. Control R T. Yeah. Just you need to get not to control uh, control R T and you need to be within the code of that particular test. Uh, I'm not sure. Show. Here, that's yes. it. Control R T. Maybe it's not down this way. So, <coughs> so I have I have a directory pointing to all my tests. Each of my tests is in a separate directory, and I have a uh, have that in a text file. So how would I integrate that with this? So you you write you you have a unit test project which is in the solution. You add the code, a unit test code here in this file. I, the, the I already have I already have code added to the solution. Yeah, and then it, you you build the solution and then you get. All it's all a is it a special kind of project? Yes, it's a unit test project, special project. So because this only works with the uh, Visual Studio unit test framework. Uh, new in. I think there was something about no, the there are some other saying that yeah. I can't do make files or something? I, should I be don't think it will recognize the make files as unit tests. Yeah, so unit, there are other unit test frameworks. Do you remember the name of the external unit, unit test framework? There are a couple of other unit test frameworks that, that works with it. You can plug that. Um, and then, of course, Microsoft's unit test framework. All right, so then, uh, right. So, um, under, under Underneath this, basically, what they do, they, they use for the export for this unit test file. Yes. It's probably a DLL. I think it's a DLL. Yes. And then that DLL gets loaded by the, the test manager, basically. And it looks for the DLL export of that, you know, unit oh, test That's why it finds our test. So all I have to do is to find a particular... Um, I, I wouldn't go that far, but you know, okay. you, can, you yeah. can start the discussion, for example, how you could okay. plug in. Okay. Yeah, can you test on, uh, on the time it took to test? Like right now it's showing one millisecond. Yeah. Can you do, say you make some code changes and you want to verify you have an effective performance for your unit test. Can you add a test to verify that the, the performance, the execution of the test hasn't changed? I do not know if we don't have any built-in support for that. Okay. Um, then you can probably write. Like there, there, there would be nothing stopping you from doing a QPC and then a QPC at the end and subtract and then assert that the time elapsed is less than whatever you expect and if it's way more than... No, but it'd be nice if it's not yeah. integrated. It's, it's not integrated. Yeah. Yeah. The MS, MS test C-sharp, I think, has an attribute that you just put on the test. Not QPC, not the test. Yeah. Mm. Uh, maybe it may not be you know, yeah. 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 not yeah. my yeah. test, but I know that there are unit test frameworks that do that. Let's see what they are. Okay. 
Uh, what are you looking for? I don't know if there's something. Uh, there we go. Uh, we, we can. So this one so cool thing. One. Justification. Uh, this one last. Uh, if, if I can show one last thing, then we can. Uh, so now you have, uh, let's say, hundreds of unit tests that you've run, and you want to analyze code coverage on that. Now that has also been. How do you do that today? First thing you do is you go instrument your binary, then go run a separate code coverage run, and then do all of those things. None of to my knees. Yeah. So you do just run here, V do the instrumentation on on disk for you, create another version of that file and then we run it. And we show you the uh, code coverage analysis right here. So so let's say this is the So um, this is the uh, DLL that we were testing. This is the service that we were in. So it shows you the blocks that are covered, then, and not just one test. We weren't expecting a whole lot uh, to be covered with this one test. Uh, the covered blocks are, so, so let's get into the, and it shows you the familiar red not covered, blue covered, and there are yellows which are partially covered. Um, those kind of things, right? So in, you don't have to leave Visual Studio for, Doing anything, this you can get all of these things that you have to do. Is the instrumentation only done in debug, or no. you want to do it in the next run? Yeah, you do. Run unit test coverage on the DVC. Um, but I assume it has no understanding of templates that aren't getting instantiated. It only looks at things that actually emitted code into the binary. Yes. Okay, so it sucks to be template programmer. <laughs> all right, so that's <laughs> kind of um, that's kind of what I had. Oops. Um, uh, to talk about. So this was all the, uh, we talked about code review, unit testing, code coverage. So I was trying to cover things that are important for C++ developers in this space, but I haven't covered a lot of things. A um, couple of things, notable things are, the solution load is now asynchronous. And so imagine a solution has hundreds of projects. Um, so solution load used to take, in some cases, you know, multiple seconds, right? 30 seconds was often reported. Um, and now, what you can do is, if you have a project open, you can start editing your files and doing interacting with your solution almost instantaneously, within a matter of few seconds, while other projects are being loaded. So that, that's one pretty cool thing. Uh, we have, are they loaded? Say that again? What order are they loaded? Uh, so so the, the first, the project that you have open, that'll get uh, that and all the dependent projects get loaded first, and then I don't think there's any order. Uh, then it's, 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 I think, sequential. There's no, why do you ask? Is, uh, does that matter? I have a lot of It doesn't matter. Uh, so, how many projects do you have? 600. Yeah, we have, we have tested on uh, solutions with more than 600 actually. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have done a lot of work. I mean, it just takes a long time to load. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, so you don't have to wait for that. That's the key thing. Right? So you can. Um, How about the time it takes to load IntelliSense? Right now it's not too bad on 2008. Uh, even that it's broken, it sometimes works. So I still have it on. So, so IntelliSense is now, it, it has changed in depth end, is not solution based. It is translation unit uh, based, TU based. So a CPT file and all the include files, that's the only word that it builds now. So it is pretty fast. And in Telsys PCHs, were they new in 2010? I don't think they, they were had new in 2008. Uh, they, they were new in 2010. Okay. We actually have a blog post about how if your project is set up to use normal PCHs, uh, in 2010 and above, IntelliSense will also build PCHs to be faster. We don't actually use PCHs. Because well, you should. For yeah, you should. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. All right. So uh, other thing that we have done a lot of work in, and if you're interested in it, is, is a graphics tooling. So, uh, what does that mean? That means uh, you can work with images and shaders and meshes and all that. So if you're a game developer, there's a lot of things that you can do in Visual Studio that I did not talk about. There are like sessions on just that. Uh, there are some Windows 8 specific things uh, that I purposely did not talk about. Uh, I wanted to keep this as a general C++ session. Um, XAML designer, we have a new UI designer for that. But, I mean, that's Windows 8 specific thing. We have something which is often could be of interest for tools developers, which is extension SDK. So you could 
actually release a library, and I could your users could just ref use that as an add reference, and it will work. But then again, it's just Windows 8 uh, specific right now. So that's all I had. Uh, here are some of the resources. Um, you can look at these blogs. Uh, I think we've done enough Q&A. Uh, I have a question about searching files. Um, searching files or searching? Or find, find okay. in files. Uh -huh. uh, so I want to search all the files that I have specific directory. Is that possible now with a new search? Yeah. yeah, you can move on for a sheet of that one. You can specify a folder. Okay. Actually, you can actually specify a new folder. You can select that. Yeah. Do you have any way to calculate code metrics? If you're looking for code complexity or where you're trying to uh, find out where the highest uh, not complex not in this are. not in this release not for C plus plus you can do that for C sharp. Uh, but why that should be fairly easy. Isn't it? Uh, but no, you can do it. we just didn't get to it. Yeah. Any other questions? So how stable is this thing? I mean, and realistically, right realistically, right now the data. You know, if I turned it loose in my code, just personally, uh, without. Exposing the rest of the corporation to it. Is it a reasonable chance that it will compile everything? It will compile everything. Uh, the IDE will work most, most of the times. And, and, but if you haven't done it yet, uh, wait for a few weeks and try the RC builds. Those are substantially more. We have done a lot of work fixes. We have made a lot of work improvements. By the way, you can use the old compiler too, sir. So oh, you yeah. don't have to change compiler, right? So you can just pick up the new UI, the new IDE. So with the all and the new intelligence, speedos, colors, all the most of the things that you need. I was to worried about debugging. Is mostly what I was concerned about in the use of the old compiler versus the new IDE. Yeah. So, so in your it's case, it's been true. It's been true in the past. I've used like 2005 IDE with the 2007.1 compiler. I have done that, but I was just concerned about this. Uh, so we have yeah, done a lot of work in. Uh, yeah. So we have done a lot of work to make sure that we can do uh, multi-targeting, and so, and there is round tripping. But unfortunately for you, it will not work because it's only 2010 and above. So let's say you have Visual, uh, this Visual Studio 11 IDE, and you open a Dev 10 project, 2010 project. It will open up without you, uh, without asking you to upgrade it to. Oh. You. And well, so I have no 2010 projects, so probably won't so, ask me anything. No way, you will ask you to update. It's what? For, for that, it will ask you to update. Yeah, if you're going from 2008, you've got to upgrade. Yeah. Project. Okay. 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 Yes. And, and, and I have to upgrade the compiler. Sorry. If you have yeah. 2010 uh, projects, you're going to do a conversion to load them into 2011? Is that so what say you that again? Yes. If you have 2010 projects, you don't have to convert them no. to No. You don't have to convert them? But 20, uh, 2008, you would. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so the scenario here is, let's say your uh, part of your team is still on Dev10, mm -hmm. and your customers, for whatever reason, you need to use Dev10 only libraries and things, so that you cannot upgrade to Dev11 compiler yet. Yeah. Uh, and but you still want to leverage the IDE and all of these features, so you can just use Dev10 toolset. Mm -hmm. You have to have uh, both the versions installed side by side, and you can use the old compiler. But you get all you that. Can that you <laughs> Actually, it might make sense just to go ahead and compile the 2010 compiler. It's because it's bound to be more stable, yeah. and then yeah. and then I use the 2011. 2010 was a big leap. Like you can you yeah. can see how much work it is, but you know, if you have 600 projects, so I'm sorry. you have 600 projects, right? So it could be. A well, well, no, I mean I have 600 projects that I have to work on now. I have many, many more projects than that that I have to. Compile. So, so imagine you had uh, Dev 10 installed on this bus, which I don't. Uh, you just go and change this to V110, yeah, 100, yeah. Yeah. And, and then it, well, it'll actually say Visual Studio 2010 V100. Yeah. So yeah. you'll have a drop down if you had uh, that thing. You just show sure. that. And, and that would basically point. So I, I did have to one. Thing. I want to the old projects would stay intact, it's, 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 but the moment you, you change something in a new project, the old project parts are out of date. So we changed the project engine when we went from 2008 to 2010. So 
Okay. So does Plankton uh, still use the old solution format? I, I use regex to generate my solutions in my project um, from a, a database, which is where our build system is based. So uh, right now I'm just taking a sample solution and using regex to build the solution. Can I do that with the 2010 solution? The solution yeah. hasn't changed much. There might be some slight changes. It doesn't matter if it's changed a little bit. Little. But if it's brand new no. with XML and everything, then. No, it is not. The yeah. project system has changed. Every single one has changed. The project system, no. Well, they wanted to move the solution for all the years, and uh, we changed that. I have a different directory for every version of the compiler. Yeah. Do you yeah. use CMake as support for creating a 2011 project solution files? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the usual people are probably I don't get it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. That sounds cool. That sounds cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.